Hello, everyone. My name is Tejas. I'm Principal Program Manager from Microsoft SQL Server Product Group. I, I lead a, a SQL Server cross-platform experiences. And today, I'm going to talk about SQL Server in Linux and specifically to the ecosystem, and uh, especially the SQL Server 2019 improvements. Now, before we go forward, it, it typically good uh, to take a look back of what has been available. SQL Server uh, 2017 has been shipping on Linux platform since September 2017. That means we have supported SQL Server running on SUSE Enterprise Linux platform, um, among other uh, uh, Linux operating systems, uh, uh, along with Windows operating system uh, since September 2017. We also support uh, SQL Server running in Linux container formats in production uh, as well. While we, uh, while we ship SQL Server uh, on Linux platform, we uh, allow it to have package-based installation. So essentially, you can use favorite package managers such as Zipper to do perform installation and upgrade uh, for uh, SQL Server on Linux platform. All the while, we are maintaining compatibility uh, when you are running SQL Server on uh, Windows, Linux platform, or container, even in orchestration environment. For example, if you were to take a backup of a database from the SQL Server running on a Windows platform and restore it on a container running in, uh, let's say, Kubernetes environment, uh, the database will continue to function as expected. So how did we bring about this database compatibility across platforms? So uh, on the right side, we have a complicated uh, uh, diagram. I'm not going to talk too much about it. If you are interested to learn more about it, please read about Project Drawbridge on Microsoft Research website. Suffice to say, Microsoft uh, SQL Product Group uh, worked with Microsoft Research Team to create a component called SQL PAL or Platform Abstraction Layer, which allows us to run same binary, same uh, SQL Server binary on Windows and Linux platforms. So now you can imagine, when you run a query against SQL Server on Windows or Linux, it's the same binary which is executing it. So essentially, it's going to uh, compile, optimize, and execute uh, exactly the same way, provided all the resources uh, and other conditions remain same. We included core engine support, including SQL Server agent, uh, when we shipped SQL Server on Linux platform. Uh, and we also included most of the other core engine functionalities such as security, AD integration in terms of security or high availability in terms of availability groups uh, with SQL Server on Linux. We also invested uh, significant resources on uh, native experiences such as uh, having uh, Linux native tools for SQL CMD or Azure Data Studio, which is a cross-platform GUI tool for managing SQL Server. And uh, we have ensured that SQL Server uh, on Linux is completely compatible with uh, SSMS or BI servers or any application that is running on, SQL, uh, on, uh, on a Windows platform. So what exactly is available when we say SQL Server is available on Linux platform? It's a big table, so I won't go into too much details about it. See, uh, but you, you can rest assured that you get the extremely uh, capable, high-performance uh, OLTP engine, including advanced OLTP engines such as in-memory OLTP uh, or advanced uh, uh, <coughs> data warehousing capabilities such as column store uh, support or polybase support. You get the uh, advanced security features such as role-level security or uh, data masking or Active Directory authentication. Uh, you get the, uh, our full su support of uh, tooling, such as, such as all to, uh, uh, tools which are available on Windows platform uh, being compatible with SQL Server on Linux, and uh, some native tools uh, which are available on SQL Server on, uh, on Linux as well. And we have been investing quite a bit on developer experiences as well, which I'm going to talk about it later. The so only real difference is some of the BI components, such as a SQL Server Analysis Service or SQL Server Reporting Services, are not available on Linux platform today. So <clears throat> now let's uh, take a look at SQL Server 2019 and what really is new 
in SQL Server 2019. So SQL Server 2019 tries to uh, solve modern data challenges. Uh, most of the customers, such as yourself, have large data estate. And you uh, typically have many different data sources. Not all of them are even relational data sources. You could have data sources which are Spark or NoSQL data sources or SAP data source or Oracle data source. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, typically a customer has multiple data sources. Polybase is a functionality which allows us to uh, provide virtualization across all these disparate data sources uh, to have a single pane of uh, uh, view, a single pane of truth. And we'll talk more about it late, uh, later. We, uh, SQL Server 2019 has modern platform compatibility. So SQL Server is available on Windows platform, Linux operating system. It's available to deploy as container in various orchestration engines. And it's even available uh, on ARM uh, uh, CPUs in uh, Azure SQL DB edge scenarios. <clears throat> uh, SQL Server 2019 br uh, brings machine uh, built-in machine learning capability and uh, language extensibility. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later, later as well. Uh, SQL Server 2019 uh, builds upon the adaptive query processing improvements of SQL Server 2017 with new um, uh, improvements under an umbrella called intelligent performance or intelligent query processing. <clears throat> it includes new query processing improvements uh, uh, for, or, for, uh, uh, for improving performance without user intervention. We even have additional performance improvement in terms of in-memory support as well. Um, we have a, a new security improvements uh, by uh, 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 adapting the uh, reality of the new secure enclave architectures uh, with always encrypted uh, with secure enclaves. And we, uh, we have always had leading enterprise uh, high availability infrastructure with availability groups. And with a new accelerated database recovery feature, uh, uh, your failovers and high availability improves even further. Let's talk a little bit more specific about SQL Server 2019 uh, and what it brings up for the Linux platform. So first set of you know, improvements are about the availability. Uh, data replication and change data capture are some of the uh, availability and ETL features uh, which are available on SQL Server 2019 on Linux. Availability groups uh, sub, uh, on Azure platform for various Linux uh, uh, distributions uh, are available with SQL Server 2019. We have uh, several developer-focused experiences, such as machine learning services uh, support uh, in SQL Server 2019 on Linux, as, as well as uh, additional language extensibility with Java. Uh, we have support for Polybase uh, and, and distributed transactions as well, and we'll talk uh, in detail about some of these features. We have support uh, for new hardware capabilities, such as persistent, uh, persistent memory, uh, uh, which includes enlightened IO, which improves performance in some scenarios. Yeah. <clears throat> SQL Server 2019 brings in support for open LDAP uh, providers uh, for Active Directory authentication uh, that enables uh, third-party utilities such as Centrify or VAS to uh, uh, in, uh, configure Active Directory authentication uh, if uh, your enterprises require that. And there are certain container-focused improvements, including my, my, all containers are now available via Microsoft Container Registry, and uh, the container images for SQL Server 2019 run with non-root uh, privileges by default. And SQL Server uh, 2019 is going to support Slash 15 very, very shortly as well. Let's take a, a look at a more in-depth in some of these features. Replication is a feature that's been available for 20 plus years on SQL Server. Uh, some of the most, uh, uh, many of the applications are built upon this backbone of replicating partial data set across many of the uh, uh, servers. So a typical usage of this uh, scenario is you can have a publisher which, uh, which publishes a certain data set and various subscribers subscribe to that data set in, one or, uh, in whole or partial fashion. It's a very popular feature uh, used in many, many different scenarios. And uh, that when SQL Server 2017 uh, uh, shipped on Linux platform, 
it did not have replication feature. Uh, our customers demanded it and we listened to our customer. So now SQL, uh, with starting with SQL Server 2019, replication uh, is uh, available on, uh, on SQL Server running on Linux platform as well. It is fully contained in SQL Server core engine package. So you don't need any custom uh, uh, packages uh, or configuration. Uh, in fact, it can be managed by existing tools such as SQL Server Management Studio, which is the popular way of managing uh, uh, replication uh, scenarios. You can, in fact, uh, 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 set up replication uh, across platforms as well. So you can, your publisher could be running on a, uh, on a SQL Server on a Windows platform, and your subscribers could be running on SQL Server on Linux platform. So we have cross-platform support and compatibility uh, as well. <clears throat> so, because of the short duration of the session, uh, instead of walking through the entire demonstration, I have taken some snapshot as I was uh, setting up uh, the demonstrations. Um, in this particular case, I have uh, two databases uh, specifically, uh, Wide World Importers and WWI Replicated. Uh, to make it a simple demo, I uh, keep the, kept them on the same server, but they can be on a different server, including a, a different server across platforms as well. Uh, I, I basically replicate, uh, published one table from Wide World Importers dem uh, demo database uh, in a publication, what I call WWI Pub, and uh, it's uh, the uh, WWI replicated database subscribes to this publication. So now, I have same table being replicated from a publisher database onto a subscriber database. And as the changes keep uh, occurring on the published uh, database, the subscriber will keep receiving the changes. Uh, this is a very popular mechanism, as I was saying earlier, and, and many of our customers use, uh, use it. Uh, and you can, uh, uh, and our, uh, based on our customer demand, we have provided to, uh, uh, we have provided it on SQL Server on Linux platform, and uh, we have brought compatibility such that you can use the existing tools such as SSMS and Replication Monitor to uh, uh, configure, manage, and monitor uh, replication as well. CDC is another feature which is very popular in ETL. It's based on the uh, replication infrastructure. Uh, it allows a user to track Changes, or it allows an application to track changes occurring uh, on a database. Uh, and now CDC is available on SQL Server on Linux as well. So for example, in this case, I enabled CDC on a table uh, a, 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 with six columns. And, and as I can see, uh, the table track is named salesperson. And there are six columns which are being tracked. And anytime there are any changes uh, that occur on, on any of these columns, they will be tracked in this uh, CDC table. So an ETL application can uh, uh, come at a, a regular period and track uh, and capture all these changes and apply it to a, a remote database. As I was saying earlier, CDC is fairly popular in ETL tools and it's available uh, on SQL Server 2019 on Linux platform. So let's talk about the SQL Server extensibility feature. And I'm, I'm going to talk about it from a problem perspective. So the problem statement that I typically uh, uh, get is that uh, I have a very large data set, but data is growing uh, at a very quick pace. And now I want to analyze it uh, and actually make sense of this large data to predict what's going to happen, not just what has happened, uh, that's uh, that's the analysis, uh, but I want to do predictive analysis. So what may happen? And T-SQL obviously does not have functions for it. Uh, T-SQL is more the, uh, data manipulation uh, language uh, and not a machine learning language. So <clears throat> uh, starting with SQL Server 2016, we uh, uh, enabled uh, uh, integration of R language, and starting with SQL Server 2017, we enabled uh, integration of Python language on SQL Server, but it was only available for Windows platform. Uh, uh, so starting with SQL Server 2019, we have enabled R, Python, and even Java as a language, uh, which is which can be called directly from SQL Server uh, in a very secure and resource-governed manner. 
So now you can extend your T-SQL language to perform additional operations such as you know, performing machine learning or even complex uh, string manipulation kind of operation for which T-SQL language is not necessarily the ideal choice. And because it's available on Windows and Linux as a platform, now you have a complete compatibility across Windows and Linux uh, platform as well for uh, this kind of a scenario. Uh, <clears throat> so let's take a look at what I mean by this kind of extensibility and built-in um, uh, support for R, Python, and Java. So in this case, what I have done is I've created a store procedure which uses uh, FP execute external script, which is our me uh, mechanism to call uh, external code, uh, such as R, Python, and Java code. It, uh, in this case, it's uh, invoking a library uh, in R language, uh, which has a demo uh, uh, about, about a well-known Iris data set. Uh, and it fetches, the, uh, it essentially reads that data set and fetches it back. I created this store procedure and I use this store procedure to insert the data into a table. And as you can see, 150 rows were uh, inserted into the table. When I look at the ta uh, table, the table uh, looks uh, like this. So it's got the data. So I, I just called a package in, uh, uh, in R language uh, and executed that directly from SQL Server in a secure and resource governed manner to fetch uh, some data. Uh, to additionally, you know, uh, to show additional usage of the, such a scenario, I also created a stored procedure which uh, uses Python uh, in this case to, uh, it, it basically runs a, a, pre a predictive analysis on a, uh, uh, on a, of a Gaussian uh, new based algorithm on an existing data set to create a, uh, to a, a model. Uh, which can be used for future prediction. Uh, I created this procedure and then I uh, ran it against uh, the, uh, the table I had already created. And then uh, I, uh, once the model was created, I uh, saved the model into a table. And uh, if I look at the uh, uh, model into the table, it's a proper binary model. Now, what I also did was I created yet another stir procedure, once again using Python in this case as a language. And this time I'm using predict function with, a mo with the same model that I just created to uh, run against the existing data set to uh, see uh, how effective my prediction has been. Uh, and uh, I, now I can see, I can execute the, uh, the Python code once again Directly with the T SQL with the with the data stored in SQL Server, uh, but with you know with Python language in this case, uh, and uh, I am able to pred uh, do predictive analytics on a data stored uh, in SQL Server, and because the uh, data is uh, uh, sh shared securely within you know uh, in an isolated boundary uh, in a uh, between SQL Server and Python as a language. Uh, it's essentially uh, kept safe and secure within the SQL Server uh, uh, machine itself. It never leaves the SQL Server machine boundary. Uh, so uh, that gives you additional guarantees of data security. Uh, to also show that uh, you, uh, not only R in Python, you can also do Java integration. I created a Java code, uh, which does reg regular expression. So R and Python are very, you know, machine fo learning focused languages. And one of the feedback that we got was that people wanted to use more, you know, uh, more natural programming language for additional uh, language extension of the T-SQL. For example, one of the popular use case uh, is regular expression search and T-SQL while capable is not as performant. In this case, uh, Java is much more performant doing uh, regular expression uh, uh, comparisons. So I created a program, a sample program, which can do regular expression uh, with Java. And I created a store procedure, which registers the, uh, the uh, class file or the jar file that got created by compiling this Java file. Uh, and then I called the Java function from SQL Server directly. And now I can um, do regular expression searches 
from uh, SQL Server itself. Uh, I'm essentially calling Java code uh, uh, from SQL Server uh, directly so that the developers have capability to extend G SQL language to do more with the data that you, uh, you have. So let's talk a little bit about another feature, holidays. So heterogeneous data access is not new to SQL Server. SQL, uh, SQL Server has had it for 20 years or even longer with the remote server and uh, uh, link servers. Uh, th that was uh, mainly used for relational data access or heterogeneous relational data access. With SQL Server uh, 2016, we introduced another feature called Polybase, which was used for uh, accessing Hadoop or the big data uh, servers. The, the challenge was that the method of access of uh, for big data versus rel uh, heterogeneous relational data was in very incompatible. So developer had to know what data source they were accessing and how they were going to access it, which is very, very inefficient. And as I was saying earlier, most of the customers and users have their multiple data sources in their data estate. Some of them can be relational databases, such as Teradata or Oracle. Some of them can be big data sources, such as Cloudera, HDFS, or Hortonworks. Some of them can be even NoSQL databases, such as Cosmos or MongoDB. And uh, typically, you want to combine all this information across various data sources to bring uh, to create intelligence out of this way, uh, disparate data sources. Polybase, uh, with its uh, virtualization data virtualization capability, does exactly that for you. What uh, you you should think about uh, think of Polybase as a semantic layer. It essentially separates how from the why. What it uh, allows you to do is it allows you to uh, define a, a data source and create an external table uh, uh, with table schema on a re remote data source. This is the more of administrative work. So administrators uh, uh, tend to know how what remote, you know, remote data source they, are, uh, they want to access and how they want, uh, they're going to access it. And once this definition is created, the developers on the SQL server simply access the data set as is, as if it's just another local table. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Think, uh, think of it differently. SQL Server 2019 becomes hub of your entire data estate. Your data uh, sources can be another SQL Server, uh, and, um, another uh, NoSQL database source, or big data source, or SAP data source, uh, uh, but with uh, external table defined uh, and, uh, and augmented with uh, information about the data source information, now, uh, developers on SQL Server 2019 can access all these da disparate data sources in a single query in a consistent manner, just like they would access another table. So let me just show you an example. In this case, what I have done is I have uh, created a remote data source named Ora Remote Source. This is an Oracle remote source, um, which has the definition of the or Oracle server, the port number, the user credential information, et cetera. And after that, I own, uh, all I did was to create uh, an external table on this remote data source with a, a proper table definition. And, and now, when I query this external table, SQL Server knows, or uh, it, uh, it knows how to go and get the uh, information from the remote data source. Uh, the, user who is accessing the remote data source does not have to uh, sit and figure out how to get the uh, data from the remote data source. Uh, the how part is separated from the developers and um, uh, they can focus upon uh, making sense of this data. So for example, if there was another table on, on this data, in this database, a user could join this external table with a local table or with another external table from a different data source and uh, they could uh, continue to make sense of this data, uh, build intelligence from this data without ever having to worry about how this data is being accessed by SQL Server from various different data sources. That's the power of quality days uh, uh, being brought to you. And starting with SQL Server 2019, it is available uh, on Linux platform. Now, as I was saying earlier, the 
poly based uh, or heterogeneous uh, data access is uh, you know it, it's been on uh, available in sql server for 20 plus years and the uh, earlier mechanism uh, for do uh, for this for uh, heterogeneous data access was link server. One of the popular features uh, with link servers was distribute, uh, distributed transactions. Uh, essentially, this is two-phase commit of a transaction. So if you have more than one server or more than one, or one client and uh, SQL server, uh, which are part of the same transaction, two-phase commit ensures that uh, it, the information is committed on all servers or all clients and SQL Server at the same time, or it's not committed at all. Uh, the distributed transactions has have been available on SQL Server on Windows platform for a long time, uh, and it uses OLA transactions uh, uh, for DTC a, as a protocol. Now, starting with SQL Server 2019, we have brought distributed transaction services to SQL Server running on Linux as well. The way we brought about it is. We have brought the, uh, the MSDTC or Microsoft Distributed Transaction Coordinator Service uh, into the SQL PAL layer along with SQL Server Engine, which would reside somewhere over here. So now, if a, uh, a client application wants to start a distributed transaction, it simply queries the RPC port to get to the endpoint mapper, RPC endpoint mapper, finds out where MSDTC service is configured to listen, uh, sets up a distributed transaction with MSDTC service, which knows how to set it up, uh, configure the distributed transaction with SQL Server. And, and uh, now you're, you are in a distributed transaction with, uh, between a client and a SQL, Ser uh, SQL Server is established. Not only that, with SQL Server 2019, we have also brought native support for XA the protocol of distributed transaction. Now, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, MSDTC by default uses OLA transactions uh, protocol, uh, which is a Microsoft developed protocol. But uh, there is another uh, open source uh, XA uh, transaction, uh, distributed transaction protocol, which is very popular with many of the JDBC and ODBC drivers. And SQL Server 2019 now supports the uh, XA protocol natively uh, uh, with distributed transactions. Uh, if you want to re uh, uh, know more about distributed transaction support, please refer to our online documentation. <clears throat> uh, so let me uh, briefly talk about SQL Server availability group support in Azure VMs as well. So availability groups uh, uh, is a feature which has been available on SQL Server uh, on Linux platform since SQL Server 2017. Uh, unfortunately, the availability group support was not extended to Azure VMs because one of the things uh, that's required by the pacemaker clustering component of Linux platform is a, uh, something called fencing agent. Fencing agent uh, is the mechanism how pacemaker clustering component uh, sh uh, shuts down or isolates a VM uh, uh, if, in case it's misbehaving from a clustering solution. Uh, and uh, thus it provides high availability for the uh, rest of the nodes. Now, uh, this, uh, Azure, uh, this fencing agent was not available for Azure infrastructure. Uh, I'm glad to uh, say that Microsoft has been working with uh, SUSE Enterprise Linux uh, team to bring Azure fencing agent on SUSE Enterprise Linux platform as well. It's already available on Slash 15 platform, and it's going to be available on Slash 12 platform in near future. SQL Server is being uh, uh, tested and certified uh, uh, for high availability using availability groups on a pacemaker cluster on Azure VM uh, uh, at this moment. And we will have full availability group support with uh, same capability that you expect uh, with on-premise infrastructure as well. Uh, available on Azure uh, uh, infrastructure. And to show you an example, this is the uh, cluster, I, uh, pacemaker cluster that I created um, on, a, on a three node SUSE Enterprise Linux uh, uh, VMs uh, on, in Azure. And I uh, configured availability group between uh, them and created appropriate availability group resources. So now you can see uh, I've got a, a virtual IP resource created. I've got uh, the <clears throat> appropriate the fencing agent uh, uh, information uh, created. 
And, and if I take a look at the, uh, the status of the cluster, I've, I've got a three node cluster with uh, uh, node one, node two, and node three online with a fencing agent uh, enabled. Um, and my master uh, for my availability group is on node one. Um, uh, and node two and three are my secondary uh, uh, replicas. Uh, <clears throat> and if I take a look at the same information uh, in uh, SSMS, you can see the same information over here as well, where I have got three replicas uh, with node one, node two, and node three, node one being the primary replica. Um, uh, SSMS even shows you which database is being replicated, in, which in this case is a sample DB named DB1. And I, I even have a, a listener created uh, on the virtual uh, IP address, uh, which I just uh, showed earlier. And not only this, uh, if you are used to creating and configuring or monitoring uh, your high availability clusters using uh, uh, the Linux native tools such as SUSE Hawk, I'm uh, happy to say uh, uh, the availability group uh, monitoring also works with uh, some of the native tooling as well. Now, uh, I, I'm going to just briefly mention some of the additional improvements such as persistent memory support. Um, uh, uh, we, you know, persistent memory is a new hardware which uh, allows you to access uh, storage devices in uh, in a very very quick fashion. And um, if uh, uh, persistent memory can be configured with uh, Dex FS Dex API file system direct access API, um, SQL Server can host the data files on that uh, in a manner where IOS tech can be completely eliminated, providing uh, much higher I/O performance. So uh, we call this feature enlightened I/O um, for SQL Server, which is available on Linux platform, uh, along with hybrid buffer pool uh, as a feature. And you can read about it in our book, uh, books online. We have uh, two new, uh, two additional features such as intelligent QP and accelerated database recovery that I mentioned earlier. And these two features are core engine features. Uh, which means uh, they are available on SQL Server 2019 on Linux as well, as, as they are available on Windows platform. Uh, with SQL Server 2019, we have uh, enabled support for some of the new distributions, and we have uh, additionally worked on improving some of the diagnostics and self-healing capability uh, around memory pressures uh, and CPU usage as well. <clears throat> so before uh, I end the session, I wanted to you know, briefly talk about um, uh, what we have learned. Now, SQL, as I was saying, uh, SQL, SQL Server has been available on the next platform for uh, over two and a half years. So what have we learned? And what I can safely say is that SQL Server on Linux is very popular. Uh, we have more than 40 million uh, container pools. We have got thousands of instances and millions of cores of CPU running SQL Server on Linux. We have got many customers and this is just a small sample of the customers who are running SQL Server uh, on Linux in production. I have many, many more customers that I've been working with uh, who are running SQL Server uh, on Linux in production uh, as well. <clears throat> and there are, you know, so there are two trends that are emerging uh, about uh, SQL Server on Linux users. The first trend is that many of our customers were using SQL Server on Windows platform while their entire application infrastructure was running SQL Server. Uh, rather, uh, it was, uh, the rest of the application infrastructure was running on Linux platform. So they were maintaining uh, Windows administrative capability just to manage SQL Server. For some of these customers, uh, SQL Server being available on Linux platform has been a real uh, uh, cost saver uh, because now they can deploy SQL Server on Linux and save on their uh, administrative capability that they uh, they need to uh, keep uh, for uh, around the clock. Uh, <clears throat> there is another trend which is emerging, which is a lot of uh, the customers that we are working with uh, for SQL Server on Linux, they are deploying a brand new solution or they are bringing, uh, migrating their old solution from a different platform to SQL Server on Linux because SQL Server is, after all, a leading uh, enterprise database management system, uh, which provides uh, the, uh, one of the lowest total cost of ownership and uh, extremely good features at a uh, very uh, in a, a good price. 
there are you know uh, there are still some questions we keep uh, getting asked when we talk with customers who are deploying SQL, uh, SQL on Linux, and some of so I want to answer some of these questions uh, in as simple language as possible. First question we keep getting asked is, is it the same as Windows? And as I was talking about it earlier, we are running same exact binary, uh, uh, you know, on SQL Server, uh, uh, on Linux and Windows platform. Only you know, we use SQL PAL component on Linux platform to be able to run this uh, Windows binary on, on the Linux platform. So yes, uh, <clears throat> it is the same binary running across platforms. And the next question uh, we immediately get asked is, is the performance same, especially if the, there is a SQL PAL component involved? And I can safely tell you that we have been running benchmark, uh, benchmarks against C uh, SQL Server on both Windows and Linux platform. And when, uh, our performance benchmarks have never been more than two or 3% here, uh, here or there, uh, to the point where Sometimes a SQL Server on Linux is faster, other times SQL Server on Windows is faster, but it's always about two or 3%, which is reasonable uh, a margin of error. So it, uh, the performance should never be a criteria for uh, choosing the SQL Server on Windows or Linux. The next question we keep getting asked is, is licensing the same uh, on Windows? And the uh, answer is yes. In fact, if you have uh, a software assurance, then you can essentially, uh, uh, deploy SQL Server on Linux um, uh, using the same license as you had with SQL Server on Windows. The another question uh, is, do I need to know Linux? And the answer to this one is twofold. If you are uh, if you are a developer developer who are mainly working with T SQL uh, language, and uh, then you don't really need to know about Linux. Uh, yeah, because SQL Server is uh, is same. There is nothing that changes for SQL Server on Linux. At the at the same time, if you are if you are an administrator who was doing some of the configurations such as installation or who was managing high availability um, uh, with availability groups of uh, failover clusters, uh, then you uh, uh, then you need to know about pacemaker uh, uh, cluster architecture uh, or storage architecture. So yes. Uh, if you are if you were engaged in operating system uh, components for while you are managing SQL Server on Windows platform, you will need to know similar things when when you are uh, about Linux operating system as well. Is SQL Server different in a container? And the answer is no. It's the same SQL Server binary which is running on Windows, Linux, and container uh, platform. Uh, in fact, the way we see it is container is just a different deployment mechanism. And, and with the compatibility guarantee that we have, you can back up a database from SQL Server on Windows, deploy it, uh, restore it on a Linux or container format, and it will continue to work. Another question is, you know, uh, uh, I need multiple instances. Uh, and SQL Server on Linux only supports one single instance, which is a default instance. So the, uh, uh, in this particular scenario, you can use containers to simulate multiple instances. It does require some additional work and configuration, but uh, you can do it. Uh, I also wanted to you know, mention that uh, Microsoft working with the Linux ecosystem has benefited not only Microsoft, but Linux ecosystem as well. And uh, uh, here is one example where Microsoft team worked with uh, the Linux kernel team, especially with you know, SUSE uh, Enterprise Linux uh, team, storage team, to implement an improvement uh, called FUA support uh, and some additional XFS file system improvement, which has um, uh, resulted in a performance improvement for Linux ecosystem in general. There, there is a blog here, uh, link, a blog link mentioned over here that you can read up, uh, more about it, uh, but it definitely uh, showcases how Microsoft has embrace the open source ecosystem and is working very, very closely uh, with them to improve the ecosystem. The another thing what I really wanted to you know, quickly show is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the <coughs> ta table which shows our TPCE uh, benchmark as of uh, November uh, 2019. Uh, and this clearly shows that SQL Server uh, on uh, Linux platform uh, is performing just as well as SQL Server on Windows platform. Uh, so 
uh, you can rest assured that you are getting absolutely the best of SQL Server, no matter which platform you choose or operating system that uh, uh, you use. Uh, we, we will always support uh, support you in in your choice of the, uh, that. Uh, I just want to you know leave you with some of these resources uh, uh, that can help you learn more about SQL Server in the Linux ecosystem uh, and SQL Server 2019 in general. And with that. Uh, I, I'm going to say thank you very much for attending and thank you very much for your time. Uh, you, uh, you should have my contact information from the first slide and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions. Thank you.